Now, most of you know that I don't tell many jokes, but uh, Linda thought you might benefit from a little warm-up this morning. So the story goes that Pontius Pilate said to Joseph of Arimathea, Joseph, I really don't understand. You're one of the richest men in the region, and you've spent a small fortune on a new tomb for you and your family, and you want to give it to this man, Jesus? Joseph said, it's only for the weekend. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. All right, so why do we celebrate Easter? What is the meaning of the resurrection? Or for that matter, why do we celebrate Christmas? These are two uniquely Christian holidays, yet they've lost their meaning because they've become so highly commercialized. Like Christmas, Easter has become big business. Last year, 20.8 billion, that's with a B, billion was spent for Easter clothes and food and candy and gifts. And that included 16 billion jelly beans, 1.5 billion peeps, and I don't even like peeps, and 91 million chocolate bunnies and donuts, thank you. But if you do the math, that's 606 jelly beans and 45 peeps for every American. Have you had yours today? Well, we all like chocolate, right? Okay, good. But I have to admit, I hate biting the ears off the bunny. Now, regardless of the reason people celebrate Christmas and Easter, historically, they recognize Christ's birth and his resurrection, which separates him apart from any other person in history. These are, in fact, the most important events of history, which separated B.C. from A.D. Did you ever think about that? If Christ had not been born and had not been risen from the dead, there would be no Easter and there'd be no Christmas because there wouldn't be any significance to his birth. There would be no New Testament. There would be no church on Sunday. And there would be no church. The historical fact of Christ's resurrection is what makes the difference in the lives of believers through the centuries. What does Christ's resurrection actually mean? Surprisingly, most people actually do believe in the resurrection but only half as many understand its meaning. According to a, a recent survey by Lifeway Research, 66% of U.S. adults say they believe in the biblical accounts of the resurrection. Yes, you heard that right. Despite what the media and some politicians try to make us think, Christians are not a small minority. But according to the same survey, only 33% of those surveyed say that they understand the meaning of the resurrection. Why is the resurrection important? Because it proves that Christ was more than just a man. It proves that all of his words were true. It proves that he conquered death so that we who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It proves that he was who he said he was, the Son of God, 
who could lay down his life and take it up again. Now, this morning, we'll look at a brief passage of Scripture that summarizes the gospel, which means good news. And you'll know why it is called that when we're finished. For this is why we celebrate Easter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, summarizes five essential elements of the gospel that are found in four gospel records of Jesus' life. As we study this passage, I will give scripture references so you will know where this message comes from, from God's word, not just from my creative thinking. Now, let's start with, with verse 1 in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul is writing to people from the church of Corinth who had already heard the gospel and received it, but some were insincere and shallow. As a result, there were a lot of problems in the Corinthian church. Some among them were not true believers and lived, in fact, like unbelievers, disobeying the word of God. So Paul's entire letter addresses that problem. But here in this section, Paul reminds the readers of the essential elements of the life-changing gospel. God has included this letter in the Bible so that anyone who reads or hears this will know how to be saved. Even those within the church who are not saved. We are saved by receiving the gospel, really by putting our faith in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the subject of the gospel or good news. When we truly receive the gospel, we are changed. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We have evidence of that right here in this church. That's what's meant by being born again, even if we don't understand that concept. Now, Paul lists the essential elements of the gospel next. Verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and he rose again to life. In addition, after he came back to life, he was seen by hundreds of people over a period of 40 days, and then he ascended back into heaven right before their eyes. As I shared last week, historians of dis different backgrounds unanimously agree that Jesus was a real person. The Roman historian Tacitus wrote in the year 
112 AD about Jesus being a real person of history. And a Jewish historian who was actually a Pharisee, Flavius Josephus, wrote in 67 AD, Jesus was the Christ. For after he was executed, he appeared again the third day and for many days following. Now you remember the Pharisees were enemies of Jesus. But Josephus wrote this while many eyewitnesses were still alive and could attest to his words. In fact, the New Testament was written while many witnesses were still alive who could have refuted it if it wasn't true. Tacitus and Josephus were not Bible writers, but historical um, historians of, of totally different backgrounds, in fact, enemies. But understanding the meaning of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection escapes many people today. So let's look at these five elements of the gospel one by one. First, Jesus died for our sins. The first obstacle to accepting the gospel is acknowledging that we are sinners. Many people today believe there is no absolute right and wrong. It's all relative, they might say. So they don't feel the need to be saved. However, Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. First John 1.8 makes it a little more pointed when it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Have you ever met a person who is perfect in any way, every way? To be more specific, I've never known a person who claimed to keep all of the Ten Commandments. Now, Jesus tried to make it simple for us by boiling it down to just two commandments. In Matthew 22:40. he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep these two great commandments, you won't break any others. In these two commandments, all the commandments are fulfilled. Now, Jesus was not judgmental of anyone except, you notice, the self-righteous religious leaders. He forgave sinners and told them, go and sin no more. He came to die in our place, to pay the penalty of sin. But we must accept his sacrifice to receive the benefit of it. Imagine that you're standing in court, convicted of a crime, and, and Jesus said, I'll pay your fine, follow me. Now, if you say, oh, no thanks, I'll pay for it myself, you miss out on his grace. Grace means unmerited favor. It's a gift. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So the first element of the gospel is that Jesus died for those who acknowledge their need for a savior. Now before we move on to the burial and resurrection, it's important to establish that Jesus really died. Because in the 19th century, Bible skeptics promoted what's called the swoon theory. Have you ever heard of that? This is the idea that Jesus didn't really die, but just went into a coma. He became unconscious 
from exhaustion and dehydration and loss of blood. Then later, he revived and escaped. A modification of this theory is that the disciples stole the body from the tomb. Now, the swoon theory, I need to tell you, really had its origin in the Koran, which was written 700 years after the events that are recorded in the Gospels. It says that Christ revived and escaped to India. Now, let's consider the irrationality of this theory, the swoon theory. First, Jesus was beaten to within an inch of his life by Pilate's guards. Then he was bruised, cut, and bloodied by Roman flogging. This was a torture procedure where a whip which had bits of metal and bone woven into leather straps was used to tear away the skin from the body with each strike. The back of the victim was so shredded that parts of the spine and shoulder bones were exposed. Roman floggings, by the way, were limited to 39 lashes because this was considered the physical limit of what a person could endure before dying. Well, the Romans didn't want the victim to die without making a public example of them. So in order to have the maximum effect of intimidation, the Romans wanted to put a living victim on a cross to suffer before he died as an example for everyone to see. The movie, The Passion, vividly shows what this must have been like. I think I cried for an hour before I even left the theater when I first saw this. I don't think I could watch it again. Jesus was so weakened by the flogging that he stumbled and could not carry his cross. But historians unanimously agree that Jesus survived the flogging and went to the cross. At the hill of Golgotha, Jesus was nailed to the cross. He laid down on the cross fire while spikes were driven in to his hands and his feet. And then the crossbar was hoisted up and attached to a vertical beam. Now all of his weight was suspended on the spikes through his hands, and his shoulders would have been dislocated from muscle strain and tissue damage. In order to breathe, he had to pull himself up on the spikes, further tearing his body. The pain of being nailed to the cross and being lifted up to hang was excruciating. The word excruciating actually came from this scene. It literally means out of the cross. Excruciating, yes. The Messiah spoke these prophetic words through David in Psalm 22, 14 through 18. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count my bones. They look at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. This is exactly what the Gospels describe. Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before Christ and prophetically gave a vivid picture of his crucifixion. Now, because the Sabbath was approaching, the Jews wanted to get this over with before sundown. So they asked Pilate to break the legs of the men being crucified so they would not be able to push themselves up to breathe and would die sooner so they could take them down. Now medical doctors say that the cause of death from crucifixion was actually asphyxiation 
not being able to breathe. But John 19.33 says, When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. This fulfilled another prophecy in Psalm 34.19, which says, Not one of his bones will be broken. But to be sure, Jesus was dead. One of the th soldiers thrust a spear into his side, and immediately blood and water came out. Now, blood and water indicated that Jesus died of heart failure. And when the heart stopped beating, water had separated from the blood in the heart cavity. Now, scoffers, like one of those thieves on the cross next to Jesus, taunted him and said in Luke 23, 39, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Yes, he could have called a legion of angels to deliver him, but that would have prevented him from fulfilling his mission which was to die for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus said in John 10:17, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. And from the cross he said, It is finished. In bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Now the second element of the gospel is that after Jesus died, he was buried. Don't worry, the rest of the elements are not that long. Before the crucifixion, all the disciples except John had fled for fear that they would also be arrested and executed as co-conspirators. They all fled except the women and John, who Jesus charged with caring for his mother. But two secret disciples, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who were Jewish leaders, got permission from Pilate to take the body of Jesus and to bury it in Joseph's tomb. The other religious leaders remembered that Jesus had said he would rise again from the dead. So they wanted Roman guards posted to be sure that Jesus' disciples did not steal the body to make it look like he had risen from the dead. The guards then rolled a large millstone against the mouth of the tomb and then put a Roman seal on it. This would ensure that no one dared to break into the tomb. This also ensured that Jesus could not break out of the tomb. Even if he had received a, or revived from a, a coma in his extremely weakened condition, he could not have rolled away the two-ton stone from the inside by himself and then fought off the Roman platoon of guards. As Jesus had prophesied, on the third day, he supernaturally rose from the dead. And the first visitors to the tomb found it open and empty. The guards were bribed, the gospel says, by the religious leaders to say that the disciples must have stolen the body while they slept. Oh, how embarrassing. Now this is highly doubtful since the movement of a, a large stone would have made enough noise to wake them up. And this also assumes that the disciples of Jesus who had fled would have been able to fight off a platoon of armed Roman guards. So what happened to the body of Jesus? This is the third element of the gospel. Jesus 
rose again. All four Gospels report that the tomb was empty and Jesus was seen alive. This is how Matthew reports it in chapter 21, verses 1 and following. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb, came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Now, I think it's significant that the women were the first to see Jesus alive as the gospel continues to report his, their encounters. The men were hiding out for fear of the Romans and Jewish leaders, but the women courageously went to the tomb even as the soldiers were still there. I say it's significant because it shows that the gospel writers who were men didn't conceal these facts because they were embarrassed. They wrote the truth as God wanted them to write it. We find that quite a bit in the Bible, some embarrassing stories in the Bible. Now, the resurrection of Christ fulfilled Old Testament prophecy as well as prophecy that Jesus gave about himself. Psalm 1610 penned by David contains prophetic words from the Messiah before he came to earth. He says, you will not leave my soul in Sheol, that's the abode of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo corruption. This is obviously the Messiah and not David. For David's body did deteriorate in the grave and he was not the Holy One. He committed adultery and murder. We also know that these words are about Jesus because Peter used them in his first sermon on the day of Pentecost recorded in Acts chapter 2. The fourth element of the gospel is the witness record. After he was raised from the dead, Jesus was seen by many people. Last Easter, we studied all of the appearances Jesus made after he came back to life. This morning, we'll only comment that Jesus appeared to hundreds of people over a period of 40 days before he ascended back into heaven. Now, Jesus didn't just disappear and, and go to India. Rather, he was taken up into heaven right in front of witnesses. Now, this is the fifth element of the gospel. Acts 1.9 says, He was taken up and clouds received him out of their sight. All the disciples, including the women, witnessed this. What they did for the rest of their lives proves that they believed. They fulfilled the last command that Jesus gave them in Acts 1.8. The last command he gave before he was taken up was that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem in Judea and Samaria and even to the end of the earth 
And so they were his witnesses. And they proved their testimony was true by being willing to die for it. All, in fact, were imprisoned and tortured to make them recant what they'd been preaching and writing about Jesus. This all happened when hundreds of eyewitnesses were still alive who could verify it. All the apostles except John were executed because they stood firm. Now, no one would die for something that they knew was a lie. As for John, he would be a missionary and a pastor for many years before God gave him the book of Revelation about 60 years later. In Revelation, John wrote of Christ's second coming when he would end all wars and reign on earth. Now comes the time for you to decide for yourself, if you haven't already, is the gospel true? Is it true that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again? If it's true, then what does that mean to your life today? 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, You were bought with a price, with the blood of Christ. He paid the ransom for you to go free from the bondage of sin and from the penalty of it, which is death and separation from God. Do you accept Christ's death in your place? He said he came to die for our sins and then proved that he was successful in this mission by coming back to life. What does this mean? It means that Jesus Christ is alive today. Hallelujah! That's why we worship him and pray to him, believing that he has the power to heal and to save. He is our great shepherd, our bread of life, our living water. He has the power to fulfill his promises. He said, I have come that you might have life abundantly and eternally. Romans 10.9 says, If we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, if you've never done that before and you want me to pray with you, please don't hesitate. I'm very accessible. 2 Corinthians 6.1 records these words from God. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So now, if you are among the 66% of Americans who believe that Jesus came back to life, I pray you are also among the 33% who understands what this means. There is life after death. And Christ alone is our hope of heaven. For he said in John 11:25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. I urge you to make this Easter the most meaningful in your life by accepting Christ and declaring yourself a believer. Let's pray. Almighty God, we do thank you for making clear to us in your word what it means to believe on Jesus Christ. 
not as just a man or a myth, but as you gave for our sin. And that you validated his life and accomplishment by bringing him back to life and allowing many people to see him again. We know we can call upon you, as we're told, in Jesus' name, because Jesus is alive. And for this, we are eternally grateful.